Thank you. So it's a presentation about um, Puppet and what you can, not about Puppet itself, but what you can do with open source as a complement to Puppet itself. Like uh, uh, you were told, I'm, I have 20 years as a Linux sysadmin, 16 years into automation, nine years using Puppet as an automation tool, mostly 100% of the times. Uh, and I'm a Nolan Brown geek. You have here my contacts. Uh, you also have um, you will have the presentation delivered by by the Ubicon. This this very presentation has my contacts. Uh, and I first want to start with a disclaimer. Why? This is not a code-oriented presentation. Um, I m did the math of every co piece of code that I would like to show to you guys and I will spend around 40 hours explaining it to you. Well, just by showing you page by page, it's way too much. Uh, and this is not a presentation or a talk on how to configure Puppet itself. Let's assume that you have, have at least used the trial um, Puppet VM that you have uh, available on Puppet.com. Uh, why? Because this is already a very big talk about what you can do with open source with Puppet. So <coughs> my contacts are on the presentation, like I said. If you need help or uh, be, a little be a little bit more specific, just contact me directly. I'll be happy to help you guys. A little bit. Um, a very fast um, uh, talk about Puppet Configuration Manager. Piece of history. It started around 2005 uh, and has been in the market presence and sometimes it was its leader, now it's not anymore. Well, it is in some markets, not in, s in the others. Um, from the beginning up until today and it's still growing. Uh, it was originally written in Ruby and released under GPL licensing. Um, after version 2.7.0, uh, Puppet Labs became a company and created uh, Puppet Enterprise. And the open source version uh, passes on from a GPL to Apache 2.0 uh, license. After version 4.0, uh, it started using an all-in-one package. Uh, and it's now written in C++, Ruby, Clojure, and some bindings to Java-based services who are wrapped around Jetty. Uh, also, the license of the, the free and open version did not change from Apache 2.0. Let's talk about the open uh, part of the family of Puppet. So we have Puppet itself. We have Aira, with the AML file-based module, variables, and host descriptor and organizer. So you can go from describing a variable to describing a whole node to the whole infrastructure in YAML files. And Puppet will automatically, out of the box, read it from there and, um, and literally um, filter your catalogs once it's, it's been generated. Puppet database, or Puppet DB, that's actually her name. Uh, it's a reporting configuration database. Uh, basically, every time an agent runs on a node, it reports back to Puppet DB so it can be stored, but also it reports its own configuration and its own facts about the system, which is going to speed up the way Puppet generates catalog because it's going to contact Puppet DB and asks for the previous configuration. So the matching is actually faster than a whole um, reprocessing of the rules. You have Razor. Razor is a bare metal and virtual machine deployer and orchestrator. We have a ton of those. There are a ton of those in uh, available, either open source or not, but uh, there's a ton of them. Razor was one of the first ones, and it was only five years ago that it became open source. It was first closed uh, and part integral part of the um, integral part of the Puppet Enterprise solution, and now it's open and you can use it everywhere. Bolt, the kid of the family, <laughs> it just appeared um, five years ago. Uh, only four years ago it became uh, open. And what is Bolt? Bolt is the, in my opinion, late response 
uh, for Ansible way of working because it's a standalone configuration manager that uses SSH to connect to the hosts. And the goodness of it, it, it actually uses, it, it can use from a script that you, that you write on whatever language and you just apply an exec to it. But it can also read Puppet code that you already have on your infrastructure. Uh, or you can even talk to a Puppet server acting on behalf of an agent that doesn't exist on the machine, which is actually quite cool if you think about it on, for example, volatile containers. So, related open source software with Puppet. And I'm talking about just the family of Puppet. Ruby, the main core of Puppet servers and agents. Jetty Web Servers for the Puppet Web Server component, which is uh, the way the agents connect to, um, to the, um, the server, the, the master server, actually uses uh, HTTPS, uh, not only the API, but also uh, full HTTPS requests <coughs> to that Jetty web service. OpenSSL and OpenSSH for both, of course. Uh, PostgreSQL is the only, right now, after two versions ago, it's the only database that PuppetDB actually uses. Everything else is being deprecated. Uh, from um, MySQL to SQL Lite, everything was uh, deprecated um, uh, in, in favor of Postgres. It's, um, PuppetDB is actually an application that reads a database. Postgres is actually the database itself that's um, underneath. And there is a, a very uh, well-known, well, in my world at least, a very well-known markdown interpreter. Um, I, I tried to find the Git, uh, GitHub link, uh, but apparently they moved, but I don't know where. It's a markdown interpreter that you can put comments on uh, with, a, with a, a very uh, a few strict rules, uh, comments on your Puppet code, and then you use Puppet Lint with the Markdown plugin, and you can write your own Markdown documentation of that module, which is actually quite cool. If you use Confluence or something like that, it can directly upload the documentation once you finish writing the code. So, can Puppet deploy or install open source software? Well, yes, it can. Well, it can deploy anything from package managed based install. So you do. So we can say to Puppet to install uh, through APT or DPKG or YUM or whatever uh, an Apache web server um, to maintain a certain branch for your favorite version control system. So you will have an application that comes uh, from Git or SVN. You can say you only use this version of this branch and it will deploy it, or even building it from source, either executing directly, executing directly the compiler itself or triggering a CI CD component, uh, not part of Puppet, but connecting to a third party CI CD that it will actually deploy uh, whatever you want, compile fresh out of the oven, like we used to say, uh, directly into your systems. So what you can do to Puppet related to, to open source software is actually limitless. But there is, of course, a configuration conundrum in Puppet open source. Why? So let's configure a configuration manager. After Puppet server is set up, the agents installed uh, and configure, it's time to start writing modules, put them into the environments, uh, and applying it to your service. So you write down sites.pp, which is uh, pp, it's the, the um, it's for those who never used Puppet, uh, pp is the instance of a puppet, puppet project. So inside the main manifests, there's this file, sites.pp, for general rules on how to apply and how to create um, catalogs. You write down nodes.pp for module, uh, node module relationship and node by node regex based rules, if you like. Okay, so you can go, uh, this is the standard way of doing things. In here, you can say that um, nodes with starting with A, B, uh, would actually install Apache. Uh, with nodes starting with um, M, Y, 
will install MySQL, and s things like that. So um, red, it actually works very well with regex. And then, but there's still something missing because you need to go create group relationships. Uh, you need to create um, specific variables for specific nodes of specific groups. And then you use Hira YAML files to create node groups, variable declarations, template rules. And it's called Hira not because of um, the relations, well, the sounding relationship of hyena <laughs> on the name, but it's actually a hierarchical um, relationship manager. But it's only YAML files. Hira is part um, of the Puppet server itself. It's an interpreter made out of Ruby. And it's working. Everything's working. Great. Congratulations, you made it. Until you hit a big infrastructure. And then you have dozens of servers, uh, or hundreds of servers, especially if they have serialized serial numbers. For example, uh, host, serialized host names, for example. Um, I used to work in a place that the only difference between all the machines was that the, s the third letter of the name which is, was VL something, so virtual Linux something, or physical Linux PL something, or CL as a container, uh, was one letter that told me which environment it was. And then afterwards, it was like numbers, four numbers. Every time an, a machine was created, it received a serial, which was the next available serial. So you can imagine. On a spawn of three years, the difference that an application would, which never received a new machine for a new version, but just updated and then needed more uh, CPU power, for example, and a new machines were created. So we ended up with, uh, I don't know, so VLPR, um, VLPR 600, 0600, and then VLPR 1045, 1046, 1047. It's a nightmare to manage if you're using regex. So you need to do almost a, 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 a node by node grouping. So you, you can end up with, for example, a 100 plus lines on nodes.pp because there is no regex possible, or at least uh, on most cases, it's not possible. Dozens of lines on Hira YAML files to declare groups because, well, regex doesn't work on SitesPP, so you go into Hira and you create the groups there. Every time you, you add a new machine, it doesn't matter the name, you go into Hira and you put it in s underneath the group and you're done. But you're going to have dozens of these lines. And then dozens of Ahero YAML files, files itself, so separate files, to have <coughs> no related variables. For example, if you use an NFS share based on an application, grouping will not help you. You have to do it node by node. So this is going to be a nightmare. Uh, hundreds of files, thousands of lines to manage a configuration manager as powerful as Puppet. Well, I call this a conundrum. Uh, it's ironic that you have so much files, so, mu so many lines, to statically um, manage a dynamic uh, configuration manager as powerful as Puppet. It's ironic as hell. So, we have a problem here. But can open source software solve this. There's more than meets the eye inside Puppet. A lot more than meets the eye. It's not just your run-of-the-mill configuration manager on which you write your files, you have an agent that reads them, and you're done. No, it's a lot more. Especially because Puppet doesn't read just configurations. It reads states. The external node classifier, which is actually the ENC that is inside the title there. The open source version of Puppet has limitations. Can we expand them? Puppet was built and thought out to be much more 
than being relied upon a bunch of files. It has a way to generate working orders, tasks and states, something called the catalog, they already mentioned a few times, uh, via the ENC method, so the external node classifier. Basically, this method relies on using data from elsewhere and help or generate directly a catalog and feed it into Puppet for every single node. Uh, and keep in mind that once you use this, there's no coming back. Well, there's coming back, but you cannot use this for a group of servers and not use for the others. You need to use them from all of them in that infrastructure. Even Puppet Enterprise, what is multifunction wonders and everything it does is just uh, an ENC with a web front end. Puppet Console is just a front end for a very powerful Ruby um, interpreter that actually is an ENC. So the methodology itself. Three basic principles. Whatever it's used, it has to be available for the Puppet's Unix user. So either a binary or a script, you need to have one single point, one aggregator, and the user that actually runs the server needs to be able to run it. Very simple. The application or script can only take one variable and it cannot work without it. That's the server host name or more specifically the server certificate name, which by default is the host name of the machine. And the output has to be a very specific YAML. This one. Um, I highlighted what it's actually necessary because you need to, to bear in mind that uh, it only works when you see certain things. If it doesn't, it fails, give an error 500 with no more, with a lot less information than it should. So, excuse me. These three dashes, these three hyphens, um, are there only because ENC can cause errors and Puppet will ignore everything on top of that. Every line that comes before it, it just gets ignored. So, the three hyphens. Then you declare classes. Inside the classes, you can have a module name. Inside, underneath the module name, you can actually uh, write a variable for that module with data in on front of it, just a module, just a class, just a directly a high-level module with nothing underneath it. The same module name, but for example, with a very specific class for that server. So you can go above the module, underneath it, you have a lot of classes, you put just one class, it's possible. Or you have other, other module name, uh, and instead of one data for um, for a variable, you have a declaration of variables that instead of one line or one string, you have an array line. You have arrays, mu multiple lines. Let's say configure DNS servers or NTP servers on a machine. You just put DNS servers and then the lines underneath it. Parameters. Even if it's clean, if, even if you don't have anything to put there, this needs to be there. Just even if you don't put anything underneath it, parameters has to be there. It's a constraint about the ENC working. So, um, it works the same syntax as modules, but this is going to be used only by the servers, by the, the puppet agent operations, meaning you will read, the agent would actually read whatever it's inside and use it as its own data. Normally you'd use this to make overrides, for example, to the Puppet server. So the machine contacts uh, the server a.puppet.com uh, and you can say, no, on the next run, you're like, for you to run entirely, you're actually going to contact b.puppet.com, for example and the environment, which is your very best friend while using Puppet. It's the, the, the possibility of using environments. Um, it needs to be there as well. 
uh, and you need to declare something. So what do we actually need? A data source with info about the nodes, a parser of that data, and on the very high level, you get this specific flow. So the node makes a request, the ENC get exe uh, executed, it does a query to whatever data source, it passes it and creates the AML catalog. And this is the ENC flow itself. Everything else is the node connecting to uh, the server, making its own identification, saying hello, requesting a catalog. This happens, the catalog gets sent, and the node, the agent on the node decides if he has to do something or not. DNC needs one single file, be it binary or a script, that Puppet should be able to run it. Place these lines on your Puppet conf, um, on your Puppet server on the master portion. So no terminus, exec, and then the external nodes to whatever path you would like. And you should be able to run it manually as well through, I don't know, an SSH connection or a console or something, which is actually, you run it with a certificate name, which is normally the server name plus the, the, the full qualified domain name. And for it to be working, it should output the YAML here. to STD out. So let's put OSS into play. I'm going to give you um, a few examples. Um, okay. I'm going to give you a very few examples. Um, and instead of going through it all very quickly, if you have a question on that specific example, please ask. I have a Q&A, but I already lost a uh, little bit of time being late. So uh, feel free to raise your hands if you have any questions about the examples that I'm going to show you. Uh, there are um, so seven of them, and there is no code involved. Uh, it's a high level, um, again, it, with a disclaimer, it's a high level uh, way of explaining how to do things. Let's start with a basic example. Let's make single group, simple groupings of machines. We already have Postgres installed because of Puppet DB. So we can create a new database with two columns, servers and groups. Uh, I don't go gonna get into specifics on the tables inside. Uh, then we create a bash script that connects to the database and queries which group belongs to which server with something like this, so a basic SQL 92 standard query. Um, this will apply in the name of the group. Uh, they will be put inside the parameters portion of the YAML response. After this, you should have an IHERA file or entry for each group you inserted on the database. So now I've taken out of Puppet itself the way to create uh, the 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 need to create inside Hyura groupings. So I'm now putting the groups elsewhere and everything else is the standard way. That's why it's a basic example. So Puppet will run, will actually receive the group and without knowing anything that it has to do with it, the group is going to be inside the parameters, the parameters of the YAML of the catalog. Uh, it will go back to the server and say, I have nothing, your catalog has nothing to do except telling me I'm on this group. And reading the IRA files, Puppet server say, hey, so this is what you have to do. And it will go and install, change, or do nothing, depending on the state of the server. Yes. It's a basic example. Yeah, no, but I mean just, you know, yeah, yeah. we don't put it in YAML files, but the more servers we manage, the more variations we have, the more, you know, that's why, that's why we need to make, the more we need to We're going to get there, we're going to get there. You have, this. Th there are two basic examples, two intermediate, two expert levels, and one big one in the, in the, in the end. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting what you're doing, because for me it's just instead of writing it in YAML, you're putting it in SQL. But like you still need 
to put the data somewhere. E yes, you do, uh, but probably not putting... In this, you have to put the data in. Further on, you'll see that you don't need to. Okay, modules by server or group. Well, it's actually the same thing, but now instead of Puppet do of the agent doing two times the, the, the run, so it runs one time, talks with the Puppet server, and it says I'm part of this grouping, so what do I have to do? And the Puppet server replies with modules. Right now it has the group and the modules of that group inside. So the, instead of just querying the group, you query the group, but then afterwards you will query which models are on the group and create the catalog generated itself. So we will pass from 12 seconds on a, I don't know, uh, 20 module setup, you'll pass from 20 seconds from this into about four seconds generating a catalog with this, which is way faster than Hyera, which takes about 42 seconds. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I did the math on performance and I'll show you why in the end. Oh, sorry. So, with a bit, a bit of tinkering, you can add queries. Uh, they can have variables on those modules of the group of the server. Um, and you can grow exponentially your database. But still, as you referred, the input of the data can be a pain. And you're actually going to lose more time in putting the data if you do this. Actually, yeah, you're right. Let's start with a fully done, so in the intimate example, you ha it's not a do-it-yourself. It's already, it's already been done. Foreman. Foreman uh, is, and was since the beginning, an ENC. Oh, I have a typo there. Uh, with plugin support. And of course, is OSS. And evolved to be a lot more than just an ENC. Uh, like, just like Puppet itself, it's now bundled with package um, of its default installation, even to take care of installing your own Puppet server. Meaning, if you installed Foreman on its configuration management um, scenario, because Foreman now works with scenarios, Puppet server will actually be installed and configured on the same server without human interaction, which is actually quite cool. Then you just go there and tinker with it. The whole shebang of um, installing, putting the repo, installing the packages, configuring the, the puppet.conf with, um, with the server requests, it's not needed. You can control every aspect of life cycle environments, groups, and variables. Now, What's the difference between forgetting that it has a lot more things to offer? On this part, what's the difference between using Foreman and the two basic examples that I told you? Well, you just need to add manually variables. And I'm not even talking about the variables itself. I'm talking about the data on the variables. Because once you commit the code and you sync the code into Foreman, because you actually go in a button and say, through a web interface and say sync the, the new modules, it'll actually create the variables inside with no data. You just have to go there and write the data. The machines, the nodes, the groupings are all done. Well, um, if you register the machines in Foreman, it's actually even faster. If you create machines with Foreman, which actually is one of their main purposes right now, it's even better. The machine is already there. The grouping, well, it's a logical thing. You can't do it by automatically because it's, it's business logic. Uh, sometimes it's not just the application it runs. It's uh, the target of, I don't know, let's take, for example, BI. BI can, can be one application, can be a database and an application, or a group of applications and a group of databases. We never know. So we have a grouping. It's, it's a human control thing. So you create a group named BI production and you aggregate the machines that you know are BI inside that grouping, but on a web interface. And the machines are already there, you don't need to add anything. You just need to pick them out, out of, the, of the, the whole universe and put it there. But it even springs Docker containers right now. 
um, and maintain data on Puppet DB, and it has a very clean um, web page. But it, although it works with every Linux distribution, it runs solely on Linux. So every Unix that you might have that can run Puppet, hell, Puppet even runs on Windows now, uh, it's been deprecated, you can't use it. It's either 100% Linux and you can use Foreman or you're screwed. Uh, and it's being backed up by Red Hat. So it's a little bit more Red Hat family oriented. Why it's being backed up by Red Hat? Because one of their main plugins that's um, package management, it's called Catello. Foreman and Catello is, are now using Celery and Pulp underneath it to become they are already the free version, the open source version of Red Hat Satellite 6, which has now been released 6.5 a few, I don't know, weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. Um, it is intuitive as hell to use. It can spawn machines and containers from bare metal to the cloud. But it has, for me, it has one big issue. It's focused on Linux only. Uh, okay, we are all here because we all use Linux and we all like Linux, but there is one issue. There's not just Linux on the enterprise market and Puppet is more oriented for the enterprise, for the corporation, on big infrastructures. So this here, yeah, yeah if you go into a client, how, no matter how big, and they told me, well, I have a Red Hat subscription. I even now have a Red Hat satellite because it's part of the uh, premium data virtual data center subscription. Well, this is your guy. Just don't use Foreman, you use satellite itself, but you can even use Foreman on with only CentOS uh, or only Red Hat or only Ubuntu. It works, it, it, it ha actually you can use you can use it. You can use it. Uh, it's package management uh, to manage dev files, either or dev or Ubuntu. It doesn't matter. But it's still it's only Linux. Let's make uh, do it yourself web console. So we already know how to make a query of that database we created. But it's a pain in, a pain to put it all together with SQL queries. So let's make it useful and pretty. Just use um, database front end, either being Django, Node, JS with Express, Drupal, Zope, HTML5, got written PHP. Um, create a periodic, perhaps weekly. I don't know. It depends on your uh, life cycle speed of your machines inside um, inside the, the, the infrastructure. A list of servers and automate the input. I'll, I'll just give you a very quick example. VMware vCenter has an API on which you can export all the machines um, through uh, one simple curl into a comma separated value file. Just use that, parse for Linux or Unix machines and put it inside the database. Half of your input is done. You can even uh, go a little bit further to have your own information and you can have a history on which no which will note it was because that info uh, information also comes from there. That's just a quick example. No, not everyone uses VMware. Um, spend about 50 minutes a week after the initial setup time, of course, uh, to making sure the relation is correct. When I mean the relation, I mean from the node to the group, for the group to the modules and the modules to the to the node itself because you can put it put modules to the node or to the group it doesn't matter it depends on how you are organized so 15 minutes a week just to make sure nothing uh, got past you either you by oblivion uh, because you forgot to put that module on that group or on that server or by um, by mistake, which you put one too many or two too many, doesn't matter. It happens, we're human. Uh, and enjoy the newfound time, instead of writing Haim, uh, Haira YAML files, uh, to write even more models into Puppet, which is actually quite cool. Let's go for the expert example. The, this is the one that I'm, I was um, talking about. Yes, 
it gives a lot of work putting data inside the database. Let's have three data sources. So, now that we have a way to configure the relations, the catalog generation, on a more humane way, uh, we can go a little bit more further. So, let's connect to a hypervisor, just like I told you, uh, the example of VMware, you can do it with KVM, you can do it with Overt, you can do it with a lot of stuff that I don't think I can remember uh, uh, an hypervisor that doesn't have an, I um, an API. Hey, even uh, Hyper-V has an API to make queries about the machines. Uh, to get the environment and the type, so which environment the machine is, which type, the resource pool, the directory, the storage pool of the node. And if you don't have any more source for the node name, so the server names that you want to have, this is your main way to go. So connected to the, to the do yourself database to get the group matchings and variables and get network info from uh, from the switching or the routers of your of your infrastructure that all ha already has this and the more apis you have at your disposal the better because you can ask anyone from another team or do it yourself figure out which uh, which api endpoint you have to use and which code you have to get uh, on the documentation and you can get a lot of a lot more info than normally a CMDB even has. So, with three these three data sources, you can, for example, define which puppet server the node uses based on network info. Let's imagine you have more than one data center, and there's a little bit of latency between them. So, what do you do? You put a puppet server on each one of them and you have one central way of genera uh, generating catalogs, and every time it runs, based on the info that came from the network part, you know which VLAN it is, so you know, or which data center it is because of the spawning um, IP trees, and you can say, hey, uh, okay, I acknowledge you, here's your catalog, but you're going to request it to your nearest puppet server, which is that one. Define things like input-output flags, entropy generation, or even file system mounting flags based on resource pools and storage pools. This is a little bit further than just IP addresses and stuff like that. It's reading from the hypervisor the kind of storage that it has. So this is puppet code itself. But because we have a new data that we never had before, just reading things out of the puppet agent. Now you can add a little bit more. So based on the storage that is used, where the data store is located, for example, you can change higher flags inside the virtual machines so that you have a little bit more performance when a normal installation couldn't. So for example, you are on a, how can I put it? on a very high number of CPUs VM. Uh, but you run a very high memory consuming um, application. For example, a database. Every query uses memory for a short amount of time. And sometimes we have too many queries, that short amount of time increases which makes the entropy generation too lower to bare minimums. And sometimes databases need entropy uh, to be high so that the random number should be used to create the, um, the serial for that transaction. So you can e even, knowing that the machine is, because of the hardware, because of the storage, because of the type of memory, you know, it can happen, so you go into Puppet and you write a code based on the data that you received from the hypervisor and say, hey, increase your, genera uh, your entropy generation pool, put it bigger. Um, even file system mounting flags. So 
uh, let's say you have an external, uh, a big data disk, virtual disk, and it's a little bit slow because it's on SATA arrays, for example. What do you do? The application doesn't, it, it just dumps the data there. It just, it doesn't have a lot of reads. It just dumps data, creates data. Hey, do an async. Um, uh, uh, ignore times, ignore files. Ignore time files or, or creation files uh, time on the, um, on the server. So we just skip it out and we put it there. Um, and we can change the periodicity of puppet runs when on the criticality of the node, depending on the resource pool, the environments, stuff like that. All of this directly into the NC code. The more you know your infrastructure and the more data you can uh, gather from other sources, the more you can extend these functionalities. Okay, let's go beyond the configuration manager. Let's use what we learned so far uh, to go beyond what Gnome will do with the configuration manager. Let's create a, a, an image of our Linux installation with Puppet installed. On your do-it-yourself uh, front end, add the capability to add servers manually with correlation between the server and the hypervisor with the process managers, the ILO, the IMM, for the bare metal ones. Configure Razor to connect all the hypervisors and server processes. Create a model that writes service puppet.conf node based on a template. Meaning, this one, meaning um, the puppet.conf itself can be rewritten, so the configuration of the agent can be rewritten by the agent if you use a template, never a file. All of this, everything that I told you, you can go into the next flow. For example, you can add a new server on the front end with a relation to groups, modules, and variables. Razor will kick in, because Razor is always looking for orders. It's daemon mode, so it's actually always running. You just need to trigger something. Razor will kick in, read the data, connect to whatever target and install the image, thus creating a new server. Bolt will connect to it. Run the puppet.conf configuration module, because Bolt can, has, can have the, the, has the, um, the facility to connect itself as an agent back to the puppet server read the variables, grab the template, and create the puppet agent. The node gets automatically configured according to what's defined on the database. And now you have an automated server provisioning bliss. And this is just one of the many ways to do this. Okay. This one is a very, very complex one. This setup is an example of what a specific company is using right up to this day. It took several years of experience and about eight months to complete. And I'm not talking about putting it together. I'm talking about designing it, Qu making sure everything would come together, making sure that every piece of the puzzle was there. It took me eight months to do this. And I, have the, uh, and I, I had the pleasure of having two big sysadmins, um, one more a DevOps than a sysadmin helping me out on this, and still, and uh, an entire team of infrastructure that gave me not only access, but explanations on how many, many, many things worked, like, for example, the already mentioned uh, VMware API, um, F5 API, the, the load balancer, uh, Palo Alto's um, firewall uh, API consumer register, which is actually the name of the, the API of status of the Palo Alto networks. Um, Cisco, uh, the Cisco uh, Nexus 7K puppet agent documentation, which I never seen in my life. I had to read it top to bottom because this was part of the installation itself. All the examples before this one is the path that I took over the years to get the ENC to run, to meet my demands more or less of what I needed. And it took me all these years, so I finished the setup a, a year and a half ago, uh, meaning seven years of my life to get there. 
and it's too complex and too big to show you the code. This one, yes, this one was the only is, was the one that I was telling you that it will take about um, 40 hours to show you everything file by file. So let's go on with it. This particular infrastructure has a very peculiar setup that proved to be a nightmare without the use of an ENC. We have 88 data centers, around 9,000 servers per average per environment, which means 9,000 average on development, 9,000 on acceptance, 9,000 on production, which is more or less what, what I had when, once I arrived there. 120 physical servers with JBoss Enterprise Edition instances, 15 15 physical servers per data center with LXC containers, which during the process of installing everything uh, were deprecated and changed into an LXD containers with no clustering, I might add, because clustering is way too recent. Uh, but it was, it was using um, HA duplication, so every node has had it on its own counterpart. Upon my arrival there, about 215 modules were used and about 1.2 million lines of code inside Puppet modules and 1,382 Hyrule files running Puppet 3.7.2. I put it there, they restricted bef before, because once, once I arrived, Puppet 4.2 was actually the mainstream one and it was they stopped there because those 1.2 million lines of code, most of them wouldn't work on Puppet 4. So they need to be revised and rewritten and the guy was on his way out so he didn't make, uh, he didn't make the, the, he didn't make the change. So let me show you quickly how the data centers were done. 10 minutes, thank you. So we had three main DCs. Five peripheral ones and a star connected setup. No set no peripheric DC was connected to uh, another peripheric PC. Everything was done through the main ones. This was geographically spread across two countries. Uh, mainly MD3 and P5 was uh, were on the Netherlands, and everything else was on Belgium. So let's talk about the puppet infrastructure design itself. So what we would have, we would have two main puppet servers on a, on a technique that is called the master of masters. Instead of one, I would have two. Which one with a puppet server, the ENC script and a Redis uh, instance that actually connected with the, the other one uh, to make a Redis cluster. Uh, the second part was the Puppet DV, and the other one has an error, it's a Puppet DV as well, as you can see by the icon, um, which is, it has the, the, the NCDB and front end as well, so backed up by Postgres on a massa massa replication scenario. Uh, and two Prometheus, I don't know why that thing got there, okay. Two Prometheus run two Prometheus instances running synced with another one. On each remaining data center. Oops. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's normal, it's normal. It will come back. Okay, it's done. Okay, uh, sorry about that case. So each remaining data center would have its own puppet server, so four puppet servers, with the ENC script, only the ENC script, and a share NFS on OPT Puppet Labs. Why? Because the reports are written in files, and because the name has to be the same as, same as the certificate, so everything is stored there on a shared um, NFS drive by data center, because the names of the instances would actually change. For example, I would have dc8.puppet.something, um, 
that will actually point to any, with a round robin DNS, to any of these servers. Uh, and the certificate inside would actually apply to a in any of these servers. Few pointers on the Puppet configuration itself. Every Puppet server, so the workers, the underneath of the master of masters, was available uh, on any DC. So uh, from the peripheric one could contact peripheric eight Puppet server with no hassle. They were all connected still through a round robin DNS entries on a power DNS scripted and had geolocation. So it would the, the round robin would actually see on which data on which data center the, the node was and send it to the sp to the your closest uh, your closest puppet server. The NFS share of the workers is, is a sync mirror Gloucester FS across all DCs spanning 16 servers and housing 64 Gloucester bricks. This was not just for Puppet. This was already existed. Well, it got increased not because of Puppet, but this Gloucester FS already existed uh, for another application and is being um, used. So um, I used it because it was underused. I used it. Redis on the master servers was set up on an active active cluster, like I told you. The NC database shared the PostgreSQL from PuppetDB and its frontends with a Node.js plus Express. The master of masters and the database servers were only the main DCs on which Ovid rules have to affinity to NHA migration, meaning it will run on, so on top of Ovid, so the open source version of Red Hat um, virtualization clusters. Uh, and we had three main DCs, two master of masters, and two databases. So mainly we would have one with no machines at all, and over it will take care of the migration if something would happen. Um, on a worst case TR scenario, it was a move of the machine, of the virtual machines. Uh, they, they were all virtual machines. Provisioning. On the provisioning, all the machines were deployed by Foreman with a Catalo plugin. Uh, as well of several formal plugins because we already uh, also used OpenStack and Azure and AWS. Once a machine container or instance was installed, Bolt would log in on a pre-provisioned SSH key, install Puppet Agent, configure it, and use the built-in factor facilities to register the system on the NC database. All data from Foreman is injected upon creation of the system into the NC database, meaning I create the machine on Foreman, every single piece of data that it has and receives from the hypervisor or the bare metal uh, system configured, it will grab it on and write it inside the ENC database. So automatic import of everything. Environment, purpose and configuration group and used by puppet operations and patching. Even patching was inside my ENC. The patching cycles were generated automatically. I just have to go there and put the timetable. Volatile instances and containers contain a special nomenclature, the name of the host names. And Bolt will not install Puppet Agent, but work as an agent and remove all data from PuppetDB when it was decommissioned. Meaning, I could spawn hundreds of uh, instances, uh, volatile instances, either containers or uh, either uh, Docker containers or LXC. Um, containers and I knew that it will only be there for a few days. Bolt would act as um, a puppet agent, would sync it out, uh, pop it on puppet DB, and once the decom command was, was given to delete them, Bolt would actually run inside the service, uh, the, the server where the puppet DB is and deleted them, not to cause machines, machine errors or errors or uh, false alarms in the monitoring systems. If now I only have to show you the flows, uh, and I can spend a little bit more time because I'm, I'm down to less than five minutes to finish, uh, and I can talk a little bit more uh, outside. So, this is the on-prem flow for um, the traditional virtualization in bare metal. So, there's the catalog request, the execution of the ENC. It does a database query and also a Redis query. Also, it gets the configuration um, that was been reported before on PuppetDB, 
it generates DNC catalog, it sends the catalog, Puppet executes it, and then it reports the configuration back into PuppetDB. What comes from here is actually when the ENC catalog gets generated, it gets put also inside a Redis uh, bucket, so it can be consulted later. The name of the bucket is the name of the server. So it just, the more you run, it just compares this with this and runs this and always uh, all, all only checks the changes on the index to see uh, of the database to see if there are any changes. If not, it doesn't even process them. It passes on. The only difference here on OpenStack is actually it does an OpenStack API query. That's the difference. Um, same thing, it runs an OpenStack API query and moves on. Uh, on Azure AWS, you take everything out of the way. You only have the database query and the API to see if it's running or not. The, data, the database has everything that it comes from Foreman upon the installation. And the JBoss EE and LXD actually just uses Jenkins config files to deploy uh, either one or the other because Jenkins um, would have a flow that, that is not my thing, uh, I didn't do it. Uh, that has a flow that will connect to JBoss EE and spawn new JBoss images based on the code it has. Uh, on LXD, the same thing. It would spawn containers based on a golden image, uh, based on the code of the application that it has to deploy. Mainly, LXE and JBoss EE instances were not thrown in by, by Foreman, but by Jenkins itself. The OSS used on all of this, so a lot of them. What's next? Well. Uh, your imagination and open source software to infinity and beyond. Thank you very much. I'll take a few questions. We're out of time. If you want to talk to me, I'm right outside. Thank you very much. Well, there's still a few minutes for questions. Oh, okay. Any questions? Let me just... Hello, thanks Hi. for our presentation. My question is, uh, could you give us uh, some good naming conventions for host names? Naming <laughs> conventions? <laughs> oh man, um, wha what do you mean? What do you mean about host names? Uh, you're talking about um, the nodes, the puppet servers, what? The nodes. Well, it depends on the organization. Um, well, it's easier when you have, I don't know, purpose like um, purpose related host names. You can use, um, I don't know. So, a uh, very, very short nomenclature to say it's a virtual machine, it's a Linux. So, let's go with the VL something that I'll tell you. So, the other one, the, uh, something to indicate your environment. And then, I don't know. JBoss 01, JBoss 02, JBoss 03. I don't know. It's simpler if you go by, by topic. Yes, of course, very much simple. But when you reach um, 32,000 machines, it's a little bit complex. So they decided to go numberings. And they were having actually an issue on production because they were reaching the 10,000s, they only have four numbers. So what they, they started to do was to, we had VLPR, so production was PR, development was DV, and acceptance was AC. They started to put P0, <laughs> so they took the R out to have an extra zero to the numbers. Um, it's difficult. Hey, my, my personal host names on my lab, which actually have about 80 nodes, so containers, VMs, and uh, host name, uh, physical hosts has about 80 hosts. All of them are Gundam names, so it's a little bit weird to ask. <laughs> Any more questions? No? no? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>